and have a crucified and resurrected Messiah as your Lord. So if you're going to be Christian, you've already reread Scripture in light of experience of God. That's what it means to be Christian. <laughs> That's the definition. We read Torah in the light of a new experience of God disclosed in an executed criminal of the first century, whom we confess as risen Lord and life-giving spirit. So, if you're nervous about experience, go get circumcised. <laughs> you know, if you're, you know, I mean, it's serious. I mean, to be, let's be logical. Let's be consistent. Second analogy from Scripture is that powerful story told in the Acts of the Apostles, chapters 10 to 15, which really I do a very close exegesis of in this book. The very tortuous path of the first Christians to decide to include Gentiles without circumcision, without observing Torah. Because remember, the Gentiles were filthy by nature and disgusting in their practice. They were idolaters. They were filthy. They had pornea writ in their genes. How can we include them into a holy people? And how the church included them in a holy people was through the powerful experience of the Holy Spirit and the leading of God in bringing Gentiles in. And forcing the community to say, what is God up to? When they have received the same gift that we have. As Peter said, who am I to resist God if the Spirit has been poured out on these Gentiles? Let's baptize them. And then the Vatican uh, calls them to Jerusalem. And what do you mean eating with them Jews? I mean, they're Gentiles. And so, how does Peter respond? Peter doesn't say, hey, who's Pope here? <laughs> <laughs> he narrates the story of how not just him, but fellow Jewish believers went to the house of this Gentile and the Holy Spirit descended upon them, and they saw what God was doing among those folks, and they all collaborated in the decision to baptize them and include them. But then, Luke leaves that story, that powerful story, and he starts telling us about these anonymous Christians. The most remarkable act in the history of Christianity was carried out by people whose names we don't know. Anonymous Gentile, I mean, anonymous Hellenistic Jews who started preaching directly to Gentiles in Antioch, bringing them in. And then Paul started doing it. And pretty soon it becomes a movement. And pretty soon it's not just Peter, it's not just a handful of Jews, it's not just those people in Antioch. Pretty soon this is a massive movement that we have to make a decision about. And so the council in Jerusalem in Acts 15 is the effort by the leadership with all participants to discern what is God up to. It's really crazy. What's the climax of that story? When Peter says, we have come to understand that we have been saved by the gift that is our Lord Jesus Christ, in the same way that they have. Notice, it's not they've received the Spirit in the same way that we did. It's we've learned what faith really is from them. This, folks, is called theology from the margins. That we grow to understand what is essential to our faith from those points of tension where the essential is skimmed off from the non-essential. Uh, that, by the way, is scripture. So it's not whether or not we're taking scripture seriously. It's whether we think scripture is to be taken seriously when it gives a commandment or a proposition, or when we are to take it seriously as providing us narratives Metaphors, images, arguments. 
What makes one more scriptural than the other? Or more faithful to scripture than the other? I'll tell you why, because commandments scare us. Like your parents. Don't cross that street. Don't go down in that cellar. Finally, the final conviction is that the church cannot say yes to porneia, but must say yes to holiness. So this brings us to the whole issue of discernment in the church with regard to sexuality. And in a sort of thought experiment, when I was talking to the uh, covenant, sorry, covenant network people in Chicago a number of years ago um, on the topic of sexuality, holiness, and the church. I proposed a mind game, a thought experiment, of adding to neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male, female, straight or gay. And ask the question, What would it mean to level the playing field in moral terms? What does it mean to be holy rather than sexually immoral? And so what, one of the things that thought experiment does is reveal how little thought we actually give to this on the heterosexual side. What does it mean to be sexually holy as a Christian? So I propose a couple of categories like maybe chastity, like fidelity, covenantal fidelity, like life-giving. So what would offend against that would be things against violence, boundary breaking, promiscuity, all kinds of things that we can name. But we know there's plenty more instances of that on the heterosexual side than on gay lesbians. But then positively, what would it mean on the side of being gay, lesbian, or bisexual? What does chastity mean? What does covenantal fidelity mean? What does life enhancement mean? Those are powerful challenges to us. Because it forces us to begin to think, not in terms of which organs we're using, which is a very dull question. <laughs> It's a very boring question, and we ought not to be thinking about that about each other, anyway. <laughs> no, I'm serious, because every inquiry into that is pornographic in character. Why should I care what you do with your organs? The issue is, what is the character of your life? Are you, are you working toward holiness, or are you moving toward porneia. Those are real issues. And those are issues for the church, you see. But until we can pose them in terms that have a level playing field, we don't even know what it means to be chaste, life-enhancing, and covenantally faithful as heterosexuals because we're not hearing from the margin. We're not hearing from the other. See what I'm saying? So we have a lot of work to do. Okay, those are my six comments. Uh, observations, questions, prophetic protests, <laughs> stones to be thrown. Yes, ma'am. How do you get the conversation started in churches? Sorry? How do you get conversation started in churches? In fact, um, I've done several workshops with dioceses, Episcopal dioceses in particular on this, and uh, you have to construct a conversation. It has to be carefully constructed. I am a profound believer in the revelatory power of story. So when I introduce a workshop, I will talk about my own story. I will talk, uh, for example, about real life fears passions, anger, hurts, those things. Putting them on the table and inviting others to own them. But then, 
as you break into workshops and so forth, you know, use story as a means of seeing how, through our differences, we are rather more alike than not. The reason I'm so convinced of this is this was the very occasion of my conversion at Yale Divinity School. I had taught a small reading course to three superb students called Christian Existence as Life in the Spirit. And I was convinced that if, if bright people were given theological concepts, and I thought, okay, let's talk about, let's just tell my life story and then read it from the perspective of the experience of power, the experience of sin, the experience of faith, the experience of possessions, the experience of sexuality. In other words, layer, keep layering your story. And we learn something about ourselves. What is the meaning of grace? Grace ought to be as concrete as potatoes for us. We should be able to point to specific moments and recognize them as grace. And specific moments and recognize them as idolatrous. Otherwise, theology is floating off there somewhere rather than permeating our life. So that was a terrific experiment. And so I put it in the, in the catalog for the next semester and 60 people signed up. I had to figure out how to do Walmart, what was started as a boutique, right? <laughs> and so I would introduce topics and then students would work in small groups and then each of them would journal. So we'd have a larger conversation, then a smaller conversation, and then individual working at it through journals. At the end of that semester, I read 60, 40 page type journals. And in that experience, change from homophobic to not. Because some of my brightest, most faithful, most impressive, most loving students came out in those journals. And I could not but be convicted. I had been with them all semester. I learned their stories. I saw their struggles. I could no longer other them. Right? I could no longer put them on the margins because they were inside my heart. They were inside my mind. I had worked with them all semester. That's, I think we need to have some kind of facsimile of that. Not debating points. Not position papers. If you will allow me one other example. I gave a retreat to the fourth uh, Presbyterian church in, in Chicago uh, 10 years ago. And um, I, this was at, right after I wrote the book, Living Jesus, Learning the Heart of the Gospel. And about 100 people were in the room, and they were all sitting at round tables. And I said, OK, I, I talked about how do we learn Jesus as resurrected Lord. And then I told each table, I want you to spend the next hour telling each other about the saint from whom you learned Jesus. Now asking Presbyterians to talk about the saints <laughs> from whom they learned Jesus was already a rather countercultural leap. But they got it. And they began to talk about their grandmother, their aunt, a teacher, a friend. We don't learn Jesus from scripture, we learn it from living people who display the meaning of the gospel. It's very seldom parents, by the way. It's usually grandparents. Mm -hmm. 